As a teenager, I was fascinated by John Conway's Game of Life. I mean, creating a virtual world in your computer where cellular automata uh, live and die based upon these very simple rules. But you know what? I, I never actually wrote the program until now. So in today's episode, we're going to take a look at Python. We're going to look at Conway's Game of Life. And we'll also talk about learning and maybe getting rid of some of those easy items on your bucket list. So as I hinted at in the intro, this episode is really about learning and taking some of those tasks that are on your short list and getting them done. Um, I've been wanting to learn Python. It seems everybody in the world already knows Python except me. So what a great opportunity. I know other programming languages. I can pick up Python probably fairly quickly. And I've been wanting to write Conway's Game of Life since I was in my teens. So why not just do it? Why did I not do it? I really don't know. Just life got in the way. But every time you think of something that you wanted to do, there was probably value in that. That's why you wanted to do it, right? You wanted to do something either for the experience, uh, maybe for the, for the knowledge that you would gain, um, just being able to say that you did it. So we all have this short list. And there's been a number of things on mine, and I've completed some of them. Uh, another example is, is I wanted to learn how to weld. So I found a local uh, makerspace, and I took a welding class. So let's take a look at this, this code real quick, and then I want you to think about your short list. So Conway's Game of Life, if you're not familiar with it, I put the Wikipedia link up here at the top. And it's really this mathematician's set of simple rules for the life and death of cells. Uh, and I wrote a simulation, which I'm giving out. You can do whatever you want with it. And we're going to go through that simulation. We're not going to really focus on the rules as much, but they're in this code. This code is very simple. It only requires a few things. I've given the instructions of how you install those things. It uses Pygame, which is a library that uses SDL. Um, so let's just look at the code and let's talk about Python. So I basically, I, I import some libraries that I need and I have some different game states. If you've never written a game, typically they follow a state model, like a finite state machine. And you maintain what state you're in, and that determines what you're looking for. It depends on the next things that you're going to try. We have a play field. I zero out the play field. So the play field is 100 by 100, and that's where the cells are going to live. But then there's a translation that needs to take place from that 100 by 100 array to whatever the screen size is. And as you see down here, there's a screen size that I set up. It has a footer, height, weight. Uh, weight. Um, let me go ahead and run this to show it to you real quick, and then we'll close it. So I'm going to go, I'm going to start running it. Okay. So we have a menu. It's in a window. You press the space bar. It gives you some instructions. You can actually draw your own cells, and then you can run them by pressing uh, F1, which starts and stops them. Um, if you press F1 again, it stops it. F3 clears the board. F2 generates a random set, which is what you saw in the intro. F1 starts it, stops it. You can clear it. So you kind of get an idea. You can draw your own. Pressing the left mouse button draws them, and pressing the right erases them. So as we go through this code, you'll see there's certain... Um, uh, scaling factors that come into play because we need to be able to convert from from the 100 by 100 by 100 um, array which represents the the world of the cells to the screen so that's what those conversions are for this is our random bit of code here to create a random play field this one clears the play field the play field is where the cells live and we have an active play field and a non-active. So it's really a three-dimensional array. You've got 100 by 100. It might be the active. And then as they go through a cycle of life, that takes place on the non-active. And those toggle back and forth of what is displayed and what's not displayed. 
Then really the heart of this thing, if you look at any per performance statistics, you'll see the get cell neighbor count is where most of the time is spent. Because of the rules that Conway came up with, we have to look at the surrounding cells to determine whether we get to live or die. So if we're crowded, if we're, we're in a very crowded space, we die off. But if we're not, and we're in that sweet spot, um, we actually get to create life. And all of that is covered in here. There's a couple um, um, coding shortcuts I've implemented to try to speed things up. Um, this is a normalized function that normalizes the position of the information um, against the play field. So this is a conversion. Um, actually, no, let me explain this better. This normalization is as the cell is moving across the screen or changing place, this allows it to basically loop to the left to the right. So it goes around the screen, if you will. And if it goes off the top, it shows up on the bottom. If it goes off the left side, it shows up on the right side. That's what all of this is doing. Um, then there's some conversions like play field to screen and screen to play field that do a little bit of math to convert between those two um, numbering systems between the grid, the array, the 100 by 100 list is what uh, Python calls them, and the screen. There's some stuff in here to show what the frame rate is. Uh, and then we really get into what the state machine is going to do. So let's go to the bottom before we hit draw. Let me show you what this, what's really going on. This is where all the code starts. We call pygameinit. We initialize a font, so we have a font available. We choose a couple font sizes. We create the screen based on the screen size defined above. We set the caption of the window. We get the clock. Set the clock at the tick. So that so now what we have is um, a loop. And by the way, this is one of the things I actually like about Python. I actually like the indention. I didn't think I would. I'm a real big... Um, C, C++ guy, so I'm really used to curly braces and, and all that goes with it. And I find myself even making that mistake in Python. I'm, I'm constantly doing that. But I actually like the, the forced indention. I think it, it makes the code look good. Um, nevertheless, what I really want to show you here is we're going to loop until the game state changes to quit. The game sta state can change to quit um, a couple different ways. But pi quit is a variable that when you go to close that window, it's it basically sets the event type to pi game dot quit, and when that happens, we set our own self to quit. So that's basically how we stop the game of life. Um, let's take a look here. We then call update. So we process these events, and these events are things that are part of pi game, like mouse movements. Um, you, you can you can basically look at, and, and if you've ever done any Windows programming, any kind of GUI based programming, you'll understand these event loops. This is pretty common. Um, you get mouse presses in there, all sorts of stuff, and you can put your own events in there too, I believe. So the first thing we we do, we process the events, and then you know look for, for to see if we're we're leaving, if we're quitting the game. Then we go off and uh, do an update, which is updating all the players, all the cells on the screen. And then we draw those cells. And then we do a page flip. So we've got the two pages. And then we're doing page flipping. And then we just make sure that we are not running faster than 60 frames per second. When we're done, we're going to quit. And this basically just allows a... Uh, a destructor, a deinitialization of the Pi game system. So let's go look at update and draw, because that's really where the good stuff is happening. So update here. This is one of the things I don't like about Python, by the way, and I'm sure that some of you will respond and and maybe correct me. But the way Python handles global variables is very interesting. You can reference a global variable in a function as long as it is on a, what's called an R value, as long as it's on the right side of an equals, meaning you're only reading from it. But if you reference it on the left side, also known as an L value, that means you're assigning to it. And, you, and if you do that, it will assume that you're assigning to a local variable. So if you do not declare them as global, 
then, so let's say that current game state was not declared. If I remove that, current game state would then be a local variable when this piece of code executed. I don't want it to be a local variable. And so my complaint about this is really simple. It's that it should be treated the same, in my opinion, at least. If you're an L value and an R value, when you, when you it's, it's easy, either always local or it's always global. I don't like the fact that it, it changes its behavior based on it being an L value or an R value. Um, either always be local unless I've declared it global or, or not. I mean, make it, I want it to be consistent. Uh, PHP makes it fairly consistent. It uses the global keyword. And if you don't define it global, it's going to be local. doesn't matter what side of the of the equals you put it on. It's always local unless you define it as global. Anyway, um, so anyway, what does update do? Well, the first thing it's going to do is look at some of the keys that are coming in. And if you press escape, it's going to allow you to quit. If your current state of the game, you're playing it, and you press F1, you know, you want to change the state. Um, like you're going to stop. That's what F1 actually does. Then we're going to go through and figure out, okay, well, of the active play fields, remember it's a, it's a two-dimensional array, which one are we pointing at? And remember, you can toggle between 0 and 1 with an XOR. Um, so now what we do is we basically loop over the X and the Y coordinates for the active play field in that two-dimensional array. And we, this is where life really, really happens here. You know, we're, we're calling this get cell neighbor count. And we're determining based upon if the cell is alive or the cell is dead, we're looking at its neighbors to determine if we're going to create life or, or kill. Or we're going to be dead. The rest of these is really just part of that state machine. You know, are we in the cell placement step where you're pressing the mouse or generating randomness? And you, you can follow all this. And then finally, we have the draw. And what the draw does again is if we're in the menu state, draw the menu. If we're in the cell placement, put those instructions at the bottom and allow the mouse stuff to work. If um, we're playing, then you're basically going to go through and draw a circle. This is where we're actually drawing the circles out. And that's really all there is to this. Um, I'm going to put this up on Bitbucket on my site. Uh, the link will be down below. Feel free to download it, play with it. Um, through this experience, I've also been working on a couple other uh, Python things and getting to, to use things like pandas, which some of you might be aware of. Um, I've been doing a lot of parsing of data. I've used um, some, some uh, uh, OCR stuff, the Google Tesseract libraries for optical character recognition. Anyway, long story short, Python is certainly a very interesting language. I, I'm not necessarily sold. It's, it's great for games. It certainly works for this one. Um, you know, it's not th necessarily the fastest thing around, and I'm sure that some people are going to complain from me saying that. But at least in this case, it does what I want it to do. I've learned something about Python, which I think is really cool. And I've been able to play around. So, so for like prototyping, fantastic. I would definitely prototype. I and mean, use Pygame for even prototypes because it lets you experiment with different ideas fairly quickly. Uh, data processing, fantastic for, for Python is fantastic for data processing. In fact, I've started writing some, some code for work using Python for processing of data like spreadsheets and emerging it in a database and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, with that, I was able to knock off a couple items off of my short list. So what we're going to do now is go over to the bench and we're going to talk about my short list and your short list. So this video has really been about trying to convince you to take your short list, look at the items, and work on a couple of them. Maybe don't watch TV. Maybe don't play the video game for that hour or whatever. Try to find time in your schedule to start knocking off some of the items on your short list. It's possible. If you want to learn to weld like I did, go find a maker space and they will allow you to uh, take a class. I spent $80 on that. It was well worth it. I know how to weld now. I'm not a great welder, but I can weld. I know the, the concepts behind it. And that's what I'm trying to encourage you to do. You can learn Python. You could write Conway's Game of Life. You could learn to weld. 
we even learn how to solve one of these, which I didn't know how to do. I always wanted to since a kid. So I spent the last two weeks practicing and practicing so that I could show you that you can actually do anything that you want to do. The cube is completely random and I'm going to solve this for you on camera just to show that it was one of the items on my short list, something I always wanted to do and you can do anything that you put your mind to. There you go. You can do anything. If I, if I can do learn how to do this, you can learn to do it too. Just try. That's all I'm asking. Take your short list, work on some items, learn something new every day, man. All right. Thanks a lot. Hang in there. More electronics to come, I promise. Bye.